Welcome. Happy Friday. I hope you've had a great week uh, and I hope you've got a great week ahead of you. Uh, it is week, uh, the end of week two in our, in our sprint uh, system here within the program. So everything's going uh, really well so far. I noticed people have got a really good start to the year. And I think this session is, is, is very timely. Uh, if you're watching this a bit later on on, on the podcast or oh, sorry, listen to it on the podcast, you're watching it on YouTube, um, you're going to find out a lot more about, about what I think is one of the most innovative um, CRM solutions that's available out there. Um, give you a bit of background. Uh, I was first introduced to Taylor and the team at, at, at Moas. Uh, they're a very close-knit team, very, very good at what they do um, through a client who uh, started implementing this in their business. And, and it's been since that time, and we did a podcast, I did a podcast last year where we dived in some of it, but um, I remember on that podcast at the time, there were a few people uh, came along and they looked at the functionality of the, uh, of the tool and they, they loved it, but there were certain things that, that they wanted it to be able to do. Um, and I wanted to come back and visit it because I've, I've, I've seen how the tool has developed. I've seen the journey it's been on and I've seen where it's got to now. And it's one of those things that I think uh, is well worth sort of revisiting. Not to mention, Taylor is usually full of sort of really interesting insights into where technology is going. And I think it's interesting when I think about technology, you know, you've got people in our industry that are deeply, deeply involved in the industry and they can see everything really clearly. And then you've got... On the other side, you've got people who are deeply, deeply involved in the tech industry. But I think Taylor because of, 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 and the team, because of the journey they've been on with implementing this, they've got this unique duality where they can look at the functionality, they can look at what's needed with a degree of separation because they're not sort of involved in some of the, 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 the traditional thinking about, you know, uh, what software should and shouldn't do. But similarly, they have this deep insight. And I, I was talking to him uh, last week about MOAS. And the thing I love about it... Um, I think it was uh, Malcolm Gladwell who first introduced the idea of 10 years in the wilderness. And the idea there is he was talking about the fact that, you know, a lot of gr uh, great uh, thinkers in the world, like the, 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 the Van Gogh and the, even the Einstein to some degree, you know, they spend a lot of time honing their craft before they necessarily put it out there. And uh, it's interesting because Moas has, has, has been, uh, as, a, as a tool, has been on this journey. That might, a lot of people might not only be hearing about it now, but it's a tool that has been... Um, been practically implementing uh, and improving within uh, within you know within a financial planning business and and just getting better and better. So it's almost like coming out like a fully formed, fully formed baby, so to speak. That's a terrible analogy, but anyway, uh, let's jump into this. Taylor, are you there? G'day, Stu. I am here. How you doing, mate? I am really, really well. Yeah, it's it's Friday. I've got past a couple of tech gremlins, which uh, seems to be the case at the moment. But um, where are you at? Yeah, actually, same deal. Uh, Friday feeling's always good. It's back-to-back um, -back meetings today, which is nice. So uh, it keeps me out of the code for a day, which is a good change. Do you spend a lot of time? Is that is that your passion normally, the coding thing? or, or Yeah, yeah the, the vast majority of time. Um, the, the team and I, we sit down pretty much nine to five every day, and it, it's code back-to-back-to-back, -to -back -to -back, which um, is pretty pretty unusual. Like a lot of the day is broken up, but obviously – in bigger bigger tech companies, but obviously it's a small team. I mean, it's our bread and butter, and we just have to get on with it. So, you you've always struck me as someone who is very. Um, I want to put, I want to choose my words very carefully. You're very social and you're very friendly, and most a lot of coders I meet don't necessarily have that skill set. Yeah, it's it's funny. Hey, I, I've I've always had that. Um, the the advice when I was at school and uni was go and do law because you can you can talk underwater, right? And um, it, it, it was a bit too dry for my liking. I did test it out, but I was always really interested in technology. So that sort of kept drawing me back to science, technology. Um, the main passion was physics, um, and which has led to coding, you know, a lot of computational physics and science. So, yeah, I've, I've got the gift of the gab and hopefully half a bit of science theory behind me as well. And that would help. I mean, like math, math so well, I imagine, is a big part of it. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, that sort of the science has a very logical approach to it, even physics and, you know, um, complex math or um, calculus and that sort of stuff. You have this sort of very linear logical approach where you can work through problems. And yeah, that certainly applies all the way back down to, to the code. How do you just just getting the coding questions out of the way up front? Like, how do you deal with it? It seems like every couple of years there's a completely new programming language comes along. You know, it's Python or Ruby. Is it Ruby on Rails? And, and it just pops, and that's the latest thing. How do you deal with that as, as someone who's a code? Do you just pick a code to stick with it or do you try and evolve your skill set? That's a great question. So um, I think a lot of the, the general consensus is that um, 
people get confused, I think, is that all all of these languages all do the same thing, but they, they really don't. Like Python, fantastic for data analytics, uh, high performance computing. Um, it's used a lot with AI because obviously it needs to, it, the way you can manage it is really in depth. Yep. Um, then you've got your likes of C and C++, which is sort of closer to the hardware level where you can fine tune games and computing performance. Right. And then what we do is um, it, it's in JavaScript, right? Well, JavaScript's the basis for us for it. Um, and yeah, that's that's primarily a web development language. So there's there's a right. lot of breadth across the different languages. So most of the time, new stuff will pop up, which is sort of like nice to keep on the radar. Um, like in, in our environment, we could use Python for a few things, but yeah. at the moment we sort of don't, it's not a necessity. So it's, yeah, it's really interesting when, when you see it come up, I love like reading about it and finding out more, yeah. but it, yeah, you sort of have to step back and go, okay, we don't need to change the whole code base just yet. <laughs> I know um, one of the things I, I, I'm, I've no, known from seeing sort of some of the speeches is Jobs was, it was not a fan of Java. In yeah, fact, so he's openly critical of it. He, he talks about it being a memory hog and, and what was that all about? Yeah, so Java was an interesting one. It's still it's it's still highly prevalent in the industry. Um, yeah. Now more so as, as I'd say probably legacy code, like a lot of people using Java would have had it implemented early 2000s and the application has stayed with it. Um, I think it's, I think particularly with jobs, right, they, they would have been doing a lot of CC plus stuff that's closer yeah. to hardware interfacing um, and that you can do the same stuff with without Java. So Java sort of gives you the same tools, but without as much depth as C and C++ can go. So um, yeah, I think that's sort of where it came from was like, he's he might have come from an era where he was used to that more detailed, fine grain control approach that Java sort of tried to abstract a little bit. Okay. And like, does anybody ever code in just pure raw code? Or is that just a, that's a Hollywood myth? Oh, Hollywood myth, 100%. Okay. Um, even the hackers you see on the TV, like the the bash script and that sort of stuff, you can only get so far with that before um, you need other tools. And it's really interesting, right? Like a lot of, you can do a lot of manipulation and com computational control from a bash yeah. script, like figuring out how much memory you want to use for what task and all that sort of stuff. But you can use that with, with other languages as well. Um, I think uh, security is, is a good one, right? Like generally denial of service attacks and things like that will be scripted. You know, someone's not actually on the other end bashing away, you know, typing keys in and all that sort of stuff. They're actually sending out an automated script and it just goes and does it and doubles down on what it's doing most of the time. So yeah, a bit of a myth, I think. There's a really great article if you're interested. It was in Wired Magazine a few months back, but it was, um, do you remember it was like 2016? when um, Facebook went down, everything went down, Twitter. But basically it was a massive denial of service attack. And at the time everyone thought it was uh, Russia. Mm. And it turned out to be these three uh, high school kids who'd basically built, um, yeah, just these, these they basically built a, a program, I can't remember what it's called, but it would infect the internet of things. At any point in time they have all these little programs running on routers and they could just and bring down things. And it was incredible. Like and it's a, a fairly basic program, and my understanding of it, it's still out there circulating around, and 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 just very simple stuff, which took down down everything. I don't think it can do it as much anymore, but it's it's interesting stuff. Matt, yeah, I mean that's the, that sort of becomes the risk of everything connected, right? When your toaster's on the Wi-Fi connected to your network, you know what? Yeah. what have we got security practices on the toaster? I don't know. Well, not to mention, I think um, the 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 one thing it wasn't that long ago, people were talking about the issue with pacemakers. Really? I yeah, might have pacemakers is, uh, at the time, it was like there was a connection thing. It was like, wow, they're relatively easy to 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 hack into the whatever the whatever the connection was, and that's that's something you don't want hacked. Your pacemaker. Oh, no. that's yeah, that's, that's a the very easy way of uh, of causing a bunch of problems, man. I could sit, honestly, I could sit here and talk to you about coding all day long and and ask you hundred dollars questions, but let's. I, I really also want to talk about the tool because uh, last time we spoke. I don't, I don't know how, how much you, you clearly remember where you guys were at, but you'd built something that had, you rolled it out and it was very much focused at the time, predominantly on the review process. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So okay. we sort of started with the CRM and then you know, online data access, that sort of stuff, and then moved into the, the review process. So talk us through what's changed in, in, in the period between you know, last time we spoke to you and what you've got now. What's been oh, the journey? Man, well, uh, first and foremost, uh, we... we Pretty much just after we spoke, there was a major uh, a software update for us, like the software that we run the software on. 
So, right. you know, I was talking about not trying not to rebuild apps all the time, but um, yeah, we, we definitely went and did that straight away. Um, yep. And we just had another great uh, improvement to all, like speed and all that sort of stuff. So all the technical stuff goes on in the background. Um, but where we were at was, yeah, we had the CRM up and running. We had online data access throughout a whole practice, right? So who's on first, what's on second, and being yep. able to see the client's perspective. So, yep. um, for example, we were implemented originally in a multi-discipline practice. Yes. So it was really important for the property and finance guys to be across loans, properties, and also, obviously, the financial planning guys have to be across that as well. So yep. um, having that source of truth and that one picture was where we started. And then we sort of went, okay, well, now we've got all this data online. How can we leverage that to start doing the bread and butter of giving advice, which is, you know, producing your documents and, yep. and getting things out, getting your, your product to, to your clients to give advice. Um, and SOAs at the time, this was pretty fresh after the Royal Commission. Oh, so right. SOAs at the time just became this 120 page document thing. And we went, look, right now we don't really want to do the compliance basket. We want to figure out you know, take a smaller piece of the pie. So we started with annual reviews and ROAs, interim reviews as well. Um, and we went, okay, well, our, our main goal is to obviously make this more efficient and also make it client friendly. So um, my business partner, so Lara, my wife and uh, Sammy, our other business partner, we all sought advice at a similar time while we we're at uni and coming into our careers and that sort of stuff. And the advice was great, but the document was 120 pages long, right? And we were like, <laughs> We were like, man, we've got to be able to, there's got to be a better way to do this, right? And um, uh, Carolyn, my mom, she's a planner. And I was like, well, look, what's what's the go? What's going on? And she said, oh, well, you know, we're downloading this and pulling this off Excel. And then we try and merge it all into a Word document. And yeah, Lara, Sammy and I sort of went, okay, we we understand the picture here now. So um, our, first, our first major uh, advice component, if you will, was, was the records of advice and annual reviews. And making sure that we can get the data to flow straight in so you don't have to merge things and download this and update that so that it's all a seamless online experience instead of having to try you know the countless things that go wrong with the the word merging is unfathomable you know so can we, we want to can we dive into that a little bit because i remember i was at mlc in the early 2000s and we created we they spent 265 million on a system called amazon um which ironically i, I might have caused a copyright breach have been a few years later but anyway and one of the things that advisors loved is we had this kind of macro that just used to go through and write the uh the the document but of course when you actually get down to it, it broke more times than it didn't actually getting something like that to populate a document like an roa or even an soa that's not an easy piece of work would i be would it be right in saying that yeah absolutely absolutely can, can you walk us through how you make it happen and what some of the ch I'm, I'm, I'm asking for the perspective because I think sometimes when you get a peek in behind how, what it actually takes to do something, you suddenly start to realize, okay, that's actually a lot more complicated and you start to have a great appreciation for, for the functionality you're trying to create. Can you walk us through sort of how you were able to pull it together so it was creating a coherent and good looking document and what were some of the challenges that you had? Yeah, great question. So um, we, we started... Um, dissecting the process first of all right so giving advice as a as a business process what do we do first do we check all the data then do we pull that into the document and how does all that fit together uh, as just like a, a, a probably a map i'd say like a process map so that we can understand where we need to start and where we need to finish uh, and then we looked at the moving pieces in between right and we sort of drew this analogy at the time that um you know general tools are for general work and you don't want to take a hammer to a screw and try and put that in the wall, right? You, you should actually use the screwdriver instead of instead of yep. the hammer in that situation. And I think that was sort of one of the pitfalls was that the general tools were being manipulated in such a way that they they were built so you could do that, but the restrictions around it make it really tricky to do that. So can you give me an um, example? Yeah, look, the word merging is a classic, right? Like it, Word documents, first and foremost, are built out so that you write a document and save it and format it, and it looks fantastic, and you send it off as like a, uh, a letter almost, right? It was, it was designed yeah. to write um, communicative um, uh, documents in the, in the early days, right? And then all of this extensibility it's like a typewriter, came... Basically a typewriter. Yeah, online typewriter, yeah. right? So all of the extensibility came later. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Microsoft Excel is another good example, like Visual Basic and coding Excel documents is, you know, as part and parcel of the advice industry. But again, you know, it was more so for 
Um, that stuff got added in later. It was more so for the generic math and actually spreadsheeting tabular information instead of writing it by hand, which was, it was miles faster than writing it by hand, I'm sure. Anyone yeah. that's ever looked at a physical spreadsheet will attest to that, right? But the, it, it wasn't built for that. So those are the two things that we were sort of like, look, if we can abstract a lot of the calculations so it's not manual, obviously, you know, that's, that's a huge uh, piece of the pie already. Okay. And then setting up a process online where instead of you have to merge and you have to do this and bring it all together, it should already be there, right? We know that the document is generally going to fall within a certain page range. We know that if we have a process where we can provide comments and recommendations that we can fit that to the document, and then we can sort of manage the layout and set up from there. So that was our initial goal, um, was right. to sort of give that structure to the document without that extensibility added on, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. I remember when, when the SOA first started to get like ridiculous. There were so many working groups. I think the FPA had one going. I know ASIC set one up to actually look at the structure. And I just, I, I mean, I think if you start with the structure of the document, you're kind of going well, but it's, it's a hard thing to get right. Yeah, it's absolutely. So much information. It doesn't flow. And even today, you know, there's still um, uh, groups talking about, you know, well, what, what actually is a goal, you know, and where should we put the goals in the document? Is that going to blow everything out of proportion? Well, ASIC says one thing about goals, we say the other. So, you know, actually trying to come to a, a rational conclusion about that is the difficult thing as well. So, I mean, again, you've got a multidisciplinary firm, right? And you're, you, I mean, we can talk, I want to talk more about the implementation challenges of this because there's adoption is kind of everything and everybody's got different expectations of, what they should have to do, but I mean, how did you how did you manage the fact that you, you you're ultimately creating a tool that's going to be used and generate documentation, and every 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 planner or every person is probably going to have a different way of talking to the advice. Did you get a lot of pushback? Did you get a lot of feedback, or did you did you really have to sell it in? Yeah, really interesting. So when we did the reviews, right, we we had this process where you'd verify the data, just check it was updated. If it hadn't been, you know, update it. Then you'd go through and set up your models and your goals, and then you'd go through and write your comments and recommendations, and right. then you'd have a preview of the document, and it would it would all be there. Um, right. And in the beginning, right, we had the multidiscipline firm had uh, three sort of subdivisions, right, for different types of uh, clients, so accumulators, retirees, professionals, that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, and some of the advisors sort of came across in that in that regard in the beginning. They were like, hey, look, you know, I don't know if it really feels how I want it to feel. And we're like, okay, well, look, obviously we can have different layouts so that you can put it in the, in the structure that you feel represents the way you want to give advice. Um, <laughs> but the majority of it was the comments and recommendations, you know, actually getting down to the, the meat and veg of the advice. It's not really about the layout. It's actually what you say on the page. Because mm. you, could, you could have 20 pages on salary packaging, right? But if you can't actually say in a paragraph, what that impact is for the client and why you're recommending that, then that 20 pages is just all gibberish, right? So we had some really interesting discussions in the beginning that was more about being able to give more concise advice instead of trying to pad out documents to yeah. feel like you're delivering more to the client because oftentimes less is more, quite literally, you know. Um, if, yeah. if the client can understand it in a paragraph and a model, you're already winning the battle there. And if you've got your supplemental information, then that's where the extra padding comes in. It shouldn't be that 20 pages. So yeah, it was a bit of give and take, but I think I think generally the way that people give advice has changed a lot in the last five, six years since we've been operating as well. How so? Uh, I think, like I said, that that can push to conciseness. Um, right, okay. Like the ASIC and QAR stuff coming out now, they've gone, look, whatever we're doing right now isn't really flying <laughs> and not really working. Um, and that's predominantly right from a client's perspective. And that, that was where we came from in the beginning. We went, yeah. look, this 120 pages, it's, it's cool that it's there, but I don't get it, you know, and we don't need tables of information to explain that over a 30 year period, your investment may increase 5%, right? That's, that's a very generic projection, right? But we don't need three pages of, of tables within the document to convey that to the client. Um, and I think it was sort of changing perspectives on that, right? You have your models and your projections, and yeah. then all the extra stuff is like your supplemental appendices information. Um, so it was sort of changing. Well, I think I think what we've seen with a lot of advisors using MIAS now, and even where they're coming from, is they want to get to that concise point. Right. Um, yeah. So we've we've had a recent sign up that was uh, coming from a, a bigger firm where things have to be a certain way, and he's gone. Look, yep. I'm, I'm giving some straightforward platform management advice like why can't i make this easier so that was i think we've consistently had that theme uh, when we've been talking to advisors 
I, 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 yeah, that's been my experience as well. Like um, the last year and a half, the work that I've been doing with advisors is usually about removing things from the process. Like uh, people are looking for, even in the training we do, they want to shorten it. They want simpler. It, yeah, conciseness is definitely a thing. So ROIs were the first one you took aim at. Yeah, absolutely. So we, you know, we wanted to take a piece of the pie, not the whole pie okay. in one gulp. Um, and it was a great place to start because it's really consistent structure. It's really consistent themes and messages that you want to convey to a client. Um, and what we did initially was um, the firm we were working with had a, a long-term progress uh, model, which shows, yep. you know, if you've been with the client for 10 years, it shows how they've developed over that time. Um, so the main thing for us was that was the majority of the review, right? It's not Oh, okay, well, your account's gone up 10 grand. We're now predicting that ex that 5% growth over 30 years with an extra 10 grand. It's actually, well, how have we gone in the last 12 months? You know? Yeah. Um, and this, this is an important point to make because this is something when you and I first talked about, I think, I, I think we had this conversation. I said, that's the one thing that, that you got some business, some tools will do it, but they'll do it in this ridiculous calculation way that you look at it and go, I don't know what that's trying to say or it's not there. And and ultimately it's, I, mean, I used to draw a picture on a diagram and say, look, you need to be able to, if, 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 if there's a, a line between we started here and this is where the client's going to get to, you need to be able to show where they are and you need to be able to show where they're above and beyond the line. And that was something that you, you and, and the team are really strongly uh, of the opinion that you should be able to, that should be front and center. It's like, mm. this is where you've come. This is where you come in the last 12 months. This is where you come in the whole time working with us. And that's what, yeah, I love I loved that. Yeah, that, and that was a huge one for us as part of the review. So, um, you know, it's not necessarily, uh, like we said, we can project until the cows come home, but it was sort of actually being able to provide that picture to the client. And that's that made it a lot easier as a process to be able to structure that in a certain way as well. Um, How much has the modeling progressed? Oh, Massively, massively. I mean, we had we had some pretty straightforward retirement planning projection models, um, some offsetting, and some loan repayment modeling, right. and then you know assets and liabilities, total asset worth, net wealth, all that sort of stuff, asset allocation. Um, now you know we're looking at property growth, property value, uh, super splitting, super with and without insurance, um, extra contributions, withdrawals all that stuff in between as well. And then the tax calcs, oh mate, it's, I think we've got, I think we're at 25, 22, 25 models at the moment. And we right. came from maybe eight. Cool. And like, is it hard to produce the kind of modeling that you do in the, in the software? It isn't, it isn't. So um, we, you know, obviously took an Excel spreadsheet to start with and yeah. that, that was, you know, where all the modeling was. So we went and right. transcribed that into code. Um, the best part about the code is that you can then verify it and test it after the fact. So if we have an offset model, say, um, a great example, right? $100,000 loan, $50,000 offset. What does that look like over 30 years? Or when is that going to be paid off? How much interest will we save? Yep. We can actually write tests to verify all of that stuff along the way. So, you know, even if we go and change something, the test might then be wrong. So we can come back and go, oh, actually, even though we thought we were making an improvement there, we've, we've missed something there. So relatively speaking, it was quite straightforward. Um, the majority of it is, is repeating over time. So it's the same thing the next year, but with slightly different variables. So, um, so it's, it's bread and butter coding, right? Like a for loop going iterating through right. different sets of data is, yeah, is, is our daily grind. So well, I guess that's why you can build it in Excel because if, it if, it, if it's a simple thing, you can build it in Excel. If once it gets harder, it's difficult to do. Mm. Um, so you get the modeling, you got the ROAs coming in. Was the next thing the statement of advice or did you introduce other functionality first? Yeah, so in between that, we sort of monitored and watched what was happening with the, the review and the ROAs and making sure that that was obviously smooth and hunky-dory. Uh, then we yep. started working on some workflow management. And the workflow management is sort of part and parcel, right? Like we have to have it so that you can track your work and what you're doing with your ROAs. So um, that came next, but the SOA was always in the back of our mind. Throughout that whole process, we were looking at the SOA uh, spreadsheets and documents uh, and information we had available so that we could start planning how we were going to tackle that and what yeah. structures we needed to put in place. Talk, talk to me about workflow because everyone's got different ideas of workflow. Some people, you talk to them about workflow and they, they, they think it's a, a Trello board. Other people talk about workflow and it's like Gantt charts and, and all sorts of things. And my experience has been um, 
you can have a really, really complex workflow that doesn't work and you can have simplistic workflow that doesn't really do the job. Uh, and you've also got this thing about any workflow system doesn't work unless people actually use it. Like when you talk about the workflow you've built, give me the, give me the context, give me the scope. Like give me, give me what you actually, in your mind, workflow should do. Yeah, okay. This, that's a good question actually because sort of looking, I think what we've built is something that I would use quite, quite often um, and it's sort of already... We, we took a lot of inspiration, uh, creative freedom, if you will, from a lot of the workflow management tools we use for coding. Um, Which so is, we had, what would they be? Well, primarily it was Trello. We were using that for oh, all yeah. of our like, day-to-day issues and bugs and things. Uh, and then GitHub released a, a lot of, sorry, I should go back, a lot of tech companies like using Jira, and Jira is an Atlassian product, and it's really yeah. great, really well-featured. It didn't really work for us because we're a smaller team. It's great if you're in a huge you know, a uh, massive corporation where you've got 30 or 40 different people that you probably won't see throughout the day. But for yeah. us, because we're so close knit, we needed something a bit more I, on the nose than that. I had a look at Jiro and again, I, like it's, it's a very powerful tool, but I was like, no, nah, it's just, it's, it's not designed for businesses like us. Totally. Yeah. So GitHub is where we store our code and they implemented a, a workflow management uh, tool and they okay. basically had a project which had tasks and those tasks could then have like checklists in them. Right. So we took a lot of inspiration from that and went, you know what, this, this works really well for us. It would be really interesting to see if we can break it down to that level for, for advice firms as well. And in a sense, it's a similar process, right? If you've got your ROA, the first, uh, so what we do is we do projects, phases and tasks yeah. and then opportunities are sort of their standalone thing. And you can, you can have tasks without projects and all that sort of stuff. Opportunities are about identifying value that's coming to your business. So you might have yep. a new client sign up, new advice. You might have a client returning for an ROA and you're expecting a certain fee for that. So that's stuff that you can either win or lose and track and keep on top of. Uh, and then the projects, phases and tasks, right? So project may be, um, let's say strategy scoping, right? So a, a pre-advice consult. So it would be yep. you know quick chat with the client, organizing yep. data, setting up access to things and then actually conducting the meeting to, to scope out uh, the advice. So that could be, each of those steps could be a different phase that could then yeah. have tasks within that. And one task, right, like a good example, one task could be a change of address form, right? Yeah. But within that, you might actually have 10 or 20 different uh, platforms that you're going to change the address on. Um, so does that make sense? That's a lot of yeah, information. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, do you have anything, uh, Julio, good to see you again, by the way, Julio, it's been a while. Um, do you have anything you could you could kind of show us? So give us a bit of a visual of what the workflow looks like, because I mean, I, I, I you know me, I, I think we, you and I have talked about workflow, and I've, my attitude is if you get the workflow right and you get the team communicating, everything else kind of follows. Are you yeah, this, absolutely. Yeah? yeah, for sure, for there sure. That's a good quiz. So I'm. Just I've, I've, got, I've got to say this one thing. I've got to give kudos to 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 the rest of the team. I mean the the layout and the look and the feel, the intuitive way this is organized is just incredible. And I know you, you, a lot of what you do is you sit down and you work through the, 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 the user experience. But it, it's, I mean, compared to, compared to some tools out there and even ones that are well-designed where you have, you know, you, you can get somewhere in five different ways and you, and you get in there and you're trying to work out how to back out. This is really, really simple. Yeah, for sure. I think that's the, one of the things is that, you know, we come from a tech background and I always say that, we get all the cool tech stuff um, first, and then that sort of gets commercialized and transferred to other industries. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is something that uh, particularly Lara, Lara has a very strong UX background, studied um, UI UX at, at uni as well as, as long yeah. as coding. So that helps massively. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty useless when it comes to actually putting things on the page. I can link up the data behind the scenes, but yeah, the, Lara and Sammy do a fantastic job of, of putting it's, this together. It's definitely a skill set. Like, no, you can see it. I mean, like, when we're, I'm not, I'll just, put, for people listening to the podcast, you know, it's really simple. There's an interface down the left and we've got tasks, opportunities and templates and it just opens out from there. It's really simple. So talk us through it, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, just don't mind if there's a lot of tasks in here. I'm on the test website on the admin account, so I can pretty much see everything going on at the moment. Um, so what we went with was a similar style to tools that we use, right? So yep. you've got your general information here, what teams are assigned, when the project's starting and ending, when it was last updated, which um, tags you want to put on it so that you can filter by things. And would that be, you can set those up so like team, a type of advice, client stage, it's literally like a tagging system. 
Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. So a good one is uh, Christmas hampers. You know, we uh, we set up one of our uh, one of our firms sets up a Christmas hampers project at the end of the yep. year, and they tag all the clients that are receiving it. They set up all the the projects um, and, yeah, and run through that. Like so. Power referrers would be another one. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, then look, these are our phases, right? And phases are very simple. So the way we use phases primarily is for a bit of monitoring and metrics. Like if something's been closed at a certain stage, how many of those projects have fallen through at that phase specifically? So, so this, um, sorry, to, so this is breaking down long uh, multi-step processes into into kind of almost like they're like Kanban boards, right? So this is first contact, first appointment, strategy, preparing advice. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, bingo, straight okay, onto it. Cool. So, you know, pre-review prep and then actual review prep. So pre-review prep could be a call, printing some annual yep. reports, checking Centrelink info, you know, all, all these sorts of generic admin tasks that you might require. Yep. And then the actual review prep, you know, would be like the completing a review, doing your modeling, compliance documentation, fees, reporting, all that sort of stuff as well. I, lo I love the fact that when I look at the, uh, the boxes underneath, it, they're full editing boxes. You can have checklists, you have hyperlinks because that, that, that gives you so much flexibility in terms of you can link through to operations manuals. Yeah, really good. Yeah, totally. So this was, this was a big update that came out with the statement of advice tool. So we right. went from a process, a linear process to sort of a free form document with, with some structure and templating. And what we got out of that was the live editing piece. Um, so you, yeah. when you're in here editing these uh, boxes and same with the document, you'll see who's highlighting things, where <laughs> cursors are at, who's adding what. And it's cool. really simple stuff like that, right? Where like Figma, Canva, those guys all do this and they, they design and um, sort of content creation platforms. But that's stuff that we used every day. You know, Lara and Sammy use it for UI and UX modeling, and it is brilliant. It saves you okay. so much time. Um, so that was a huge thing that we wanted to focus on as well. T did, you, did you end up implementing templates? Yeah, we did. So um, we've got templates for documents, templates for all of the tasking and projects as well. So I'll just show you an example. It looks very yeah. much the same. So for example, an annual review uh, template, this one's been edited recently, so I think everything's all in one. Uh, but generally what happens, yeah, yeah. right, is you've got your time frame in what duration you want it. So this will, based on when you start it, it will set out X amount of days or weeks after that is the due date. And okay. same for the task, you know, this could be zero days from the start date, so the that. first day it starts. I love um, the fact you've, you've got the due option. It can be after no, start date or end date because there's a, like, one of the, one of the most well-used one is Asana. I can't mm. stand Asana. It's just, it's missing so many basic bits of functionality. And that's one of them. It's like, like for example, a review, a, a re review meeting, you should be able to set up the thread based on when the review day is. But yeah. in a lot of tools, you can't do it. It's crazy. Yeah, totally. Asana is an interesting one because they started with a very basic um, tasking system and it worked really well for just getting high volume stuff done that wasn't necessarily projects or needed to be managed. It was just sort of one-off in items. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Just, so yeah. even they've, they've, they've got workarounds for you create a project and then you copy. It's just like no, I don't want to be able to do that. Yeah, I don't totally. Want to do that. Um, man, it looks great. Uh, cheers, thank you. What well, what's the? I mean, that we've done some work together on the dashboard, and I think that's a that's a big one, isn't it? Yeah. So the dashboard uh, with the admin view, I should apologize. The admin view is pretty bare bones, but this would have your ongoing advice, um, obviously projects, tasks, and opportunities due today. Yep. And depending on what role you're in within the, the business would then show different information. Obviously, property and finance guys don't always need to be across ongoing advice. Um, they're probably more relevant to uh, different projects and things that they want to monitor. Um, so, yeah. Nice. I'm actually going to, I've got one of your brochures. I just realized I, was, I meant to put it. Jen, can you grab the Moas brochures? They're in the, well, where is it showing? Closing folder. They are under old structure, clients and programs curriculum. Can you grab those three and pop them in the box for me? And just so people can download them and get a bit more information. So um, let's, let's talk, like workflow, you got that in. Mm -hmm. Was statement advice next or was there something else that was, that was coming down the pike? Yeah, well, look, great question. So what I'll do is I'll just jump into a uh, group here. I've just redacted a whole bunch of stuff. So uh, this is the group, group view, right? So Sorry, I've just taken shared screen off, I apologize. Oh, that's all right. I'll, I'll put it back on. Uh, so yeah, this is the group, the group page, and we do things by groups, right? So John and Jane Smith 
uh, as, as clients, a couple, for example, that then have entities. That's all under that one group. Um, and, you know, this could just be John's book on his own. I, I read that all the information is visible here, right? Yeah, everything. So okay, cool. contact details, employment yep. notes, all that sort of stuff. We've got our financial data on the left, you know, so offset accounts, loans. Uh, okay. We can look at detailed information here. Does it have an offset account registered to it? Is it secured by a property? So this is all stuff that obviously advisors need to know. Also, this finance. Is, this, is, this is dummy dummy data, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was just like, I was like oh, yeah. Go on, yeah. Go. <laughs> yeah. So, um, no, I mean, the account number is, you know, zero three, right? So, if you if you rock up to Westpac, I don't think they'll give you much on the zero three. Give it a go. You never know. Yeah, <laughs> you never know. I've probably just outed like their third client ever. You know. <laughs> so yeah. Um, okay. Look, all this stuff we have to be very transparent with, and it has to be there. This is a, a client that we test on quite often. So they've got loads of loans, loads of liabilities, yeah. supers, all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. So getting into the advice side of things, right? Yeah. So we've got our advice tab here. And in order to start the advice process, what you do is you'd hit, you know, add advice. And let's yep. say this one's a statement of advice, right? So we'll jump in and have a look at this. And this is this process I was talking about before, right? So this was a similar process for the review that we've tweaked yep. and updated for the statement of advice. So, you know, again, bread and butter stuff that you have to have. You've got to have your team. So you might have, and this is for uh, solo advisors as well. Maybe you've got a third-party accountant that uses your system that needs to be on some stuff. So for the example wow. here, we've got the planning team. We've also got the accounting team and finance team because these clients right. have a lot going on with finance, a lot going on uh, with entity structures and accounting as well. Um, yeah. So it's really important to have that, that um, uh, what's the word? Oh man, visibility across the board. Transparency, kind of. Transparency, yeah. 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 So what I'll do is I'll just move through the process. Yeah. So yeah, okay. verify data. This is what we're talking about before. So who's it been updated by when? So ten days ago by me, right? So I know that this is relatively up to date, and this is sort of to get away from that. Oh, okay, there's a value there. I'm just going to run with it, you know, because clients will pick up on that. They'll go, oh well, that was the property value twelve months ago. You know, right. we've just had it revalued. What's going on? So it's sort of to try and give advisors and anyone in the system a bit of accountability over, you know, when was this updated and are we actually giving accurate advice here? That's because that's a really good point. And this is the one thing that um, and I used to see it all the time when practices would use my prosperity and they, 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 they were trying to take control of the cash flow. As soon as the client noticed, if you've got a large body of data, if your data is not right, that will become the topic of the conversation. Oh, that's not right. That's not right. And if you can just stall a meeting. So... Yeah, being able to if you're going to have a massive data set, being able to control the the I guess the quality and up to dateness of it, that's really important. Absolutely, and even you know you can use it and justify that as well. You can go, hey, look, I know this information is out of date. We're waiting on right. an RP data report to come back, but just bear in mind that this will be updated with a new value, right? I mean, that's part and parcel of the changing values in advice, right? Yeah, that makes total sense. Okay, so this is all the data input stuff. Yeah, this is all the data input stuff. It is a spit out basically of the advice page uh, or the financial data page on the group page. So, you know, you can download a CSV and what a lot of our mortgage and finance guys do is they'll download this CSV, upload that information into their loan writing software. And then that right. way they're already steps ahead on the loan writing process instead of having to, you know, fiddle with data there. What's your take? You must, I mean, you must get a lot of inquiries or a lot of conversations about um, digital fact finding, if you like. Like having yeah. the ability to provide, provide something to a client, they fill it in for you. What's, can you give us your experiences with it? Yeah, great question. So um, when we started out, the firm we were working with already had my, uh, my prosperity as their digital fact find, right? Right. Um, and I think they did a really good job of it to start with, right? Where it's a pretty straightforward process for the client. Yes, it's still relatively in-depth. Um, so for us, what we've been doing is we've sort of, at the moment, we've let our advisors go with whatever their preferred fact find method is. Right. Uh, we're okay. already looking at building a client portal and we've got the Yodely feeds that we're starting to work with as well. So, you know, it's it's there. And the main thing for us, right, was when we started, um, some, of, some of the uh, uh, more experienced people in industry said, you know what, you should go and integrate with all of these 20 platforms before you even had a, have a product. And we were yeah, like, I want well, to talk about this because you didn't. Yeah, exactly. We were like, well, look, if we go and do that and just grab all the spaghetti and try and pile it together, it's it's still a glob of spaghetti, right? It's not going to actually give <laughs> me anything useful out of it. So we 
this is probably a terrible analogy, but you know, it's it's sort of like that where if you if you take all these different components from everywhere, but don't actually have a way to consolidate it, then it's just mm. a regurg regurgitation of what you've already got. Um, yeah, so we. Sorry, Stu, go ahead. And we talked about this last time. It's because, like, okay, if you do go, okay, we're going to integrate 20 different platforms, then you've got to go, okay, what do you call a first name field? And what do you call a first name field? And what do you call it? And then you're getting down to, you know, what do you call, I don't know, the, the first holding field? And just being able to match all of these, these fields together and then manage the data that's coming in, that's, that's, that's an extraordinarily, I'm not going to say difficult. It's, it's got to be a finickety and potentially fragile process. Yeah, absolutely. And to be blunt, you know, three of us just straight up couldn't manage it. Uh, even if we did, let's say, six integrations and one of them had an update over the weekend that we then have to update for, you know, we're not talking Facebook, Google or um, Microsoft here where APIs are versioned and you have a specific version and you can still keep running off that and that's the way it goes. There's a lot of tools in industry that are, you know, pretty reactive to the way that they change. So if we went and integrated with a bunch of stuff, two things changed overnight, you know, we could be in a really sticky situation for months. And yeah. so we wanted to avoid that and actually build something that's going to be useful. Why, why is that? I mean, you, you mentioned there that the Googles and the Facebook, obviously they're, they're a lot bigger, but they have protocols and they kind of recognize the fact that we can't just go and change everything overnight because there's people who rely on it. And yet in the industry, my, if I'm, and tell me if I've got this wrong, you've got all these platform providers who can just overnight change their, their, their data feeds and screw a bunch of people up. Why, why, is, that, why is that prevalent in, in this industry? Great question. I think there hasn't been any standardization around it, really speaking, until open banking sort of came in because everyone would do their own thing in their own way, right? Like insurance providers, I mean, if you can get insurance data feeds, they would give you their information the way they wanted. Um, right. Same with a lot of platforms. That some, like some things are really silly, and we're guilty of this on some 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 spots in our app, where you might have an offset account that's that's called Value, right? Which is you know hundred hundred dollars, right? But maybe we've got um, a share portfolio that's Amount, right? Which is two hundred dollars, but it's the same thing. It's just called mm. two different things. And there was a lot of that. Yeah. Um, and still is a lot of that open banking is really trying to get the reins on that and go, well, look, between this bank and that bank, just call account value or account amount, just call it value, right? So actually standardizing that process is, is a massive one. Um, Google has a whole list of nomenclature on what you should expect and what things should be called and then how, how that's not going to change for some things, you know? So yeah. I think the standardization was missing there and it was, it was a bit wild west and in a way in a good way right there was a lot of innovation with the data feeds and tech in the early stages and it seemed like we were going to be gung-ho with it yeah. and then it sort of petered off right like i've seen uh, examples with uh traffic light systems where you know green is the data feeds working yellows the data feeds are a bit tricky today and then red is there's it's just not working and of course right. you go and check the status and everything's red except for one platform right and that's because of that standardization. Like it's such a tricky thing to keep up with. Carolyn, last question. I, I, this is exactly what I was thinking. Open banking, like when it was announced, it was, it was exciting. It felt like, oh, thank God. And Carolyn says it's 12 months behind. I mean, it feels like it's just been on the back foot from day one. Um, do you think it's actually going to make that much difference? Or do you think it's always going to be on the verge of, of having an impact? Yeah, I think it's I think it's just adoption, right? Like if if you are hesitant about certain technologies or big players in the game don't want to get involved, um, then that will hinder progress, right? Like uh, AI is a great one. Everyone thinks AI is twelve months ahead, but the reality is it's sort of it's it's in a place where it's good, but it's not fantastic, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're like, this this is an interesting one, right? I think if you look at a useful tool and go, yeah, but not now. Whereas if you look at a challenging tool and go, yeah, let's use that. It's you, you, that timing is really important. I think you have to make the most of what you've got available to you. Yeah. I think open banking is one of those tools in the tool belt that you you almost have to have. Oh, standardization, because otherwise, the more complex things get, the more you need some sort of standardization, particularly when you've introduced technology. Because ultimately, I don't know whether AI is going to help, whether AI is going to be able to sit in between and maybe interpret. Well, you know, I know that says account number, but what it actually means is yeah possibly but again like we were speaking about this before we came on and, and i think you and i both share a similar opinion which is ai is incredibly ex interesting 
Uh, it's a real leap forward. I can't think of a leap forward technologically that's happened so quickly since the iPhone, to be really honest. When that, when that trotted out, everyone was like, oh my God, it's a computer in your pocket. But I, I, like, I, think, I think it is being over, overhyped as to what it can do. I think it's really good at doing certain things, but um, I certainly wouldn't let an AI tool loose in my inbox. I wouldn't let it send stuff on its own. I, I, you know, I wouldn't let it do research. I think the SEC in the US are of the same opinion. I think ASIC are coming around that AI shouldn't be anywhere near research or, or, or portfolio modeling or anything like that for the time being. I think it's great, but I, you know, I sometimes see people wandering around spruiking AI and they're the same people who are, who are talking up chatbots and God knows what before. It's, yeah, it's a bit of stone soup all over again, right? Well, and that's a great point, yeah. So um, getting back to that, that open banking point, they've added interest rates, loan expiries and all that sort of stuff I think in the last 12 months, right? So, and it's, it's, it's a great point about AI, right? Is it there yet for some specific tasks? No, but generally how helpful is it? Very, right? Like I think, I think the universally content, we can accept Creating content, rewording content, copy, anything to do with written content, fantastic. Right, bingo. So even open banking, now that we've got that bit of extra information, how useful is it? It's actually really useful, right? So having that tool sure. in your tool belt is very important. Uh, yeah, and the, the AI hype is huge, right? Um, yeah. For for a coding perspective, if you're in a a big organization, you generally have the the funds and the ability to analyze everything in your code base and leverage it to the hilt, which is great. Um, but at the moment, it's sort of commercially, it's sort of at a point where it will help you along the way, but it won't do your job for you. So you still yeah. have to like the specifics with the live updating stuff that we've implemented with the highlighting the cursor and stuff like. AI has no idea what's happening there. The information it has access to on the packages that that run that stuff is 12 months out of date, right? So, but can it help me write up a general for loop to go to print out 10 documents? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm putting together case studies for our bulletproof pricing course that starts next week. And I, like five years ago, I'd have to sit down, I have to go through the case studies myself. I just go, hey, get voila, uh, write me 10 uh, case studies for a pricing exercise. I, these are the information, we're done. Uh, give me a list of all of the potential tasks that could be considered chargeable in the advice business, advisor's business. It's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, producing content at a very fast rate, it's, it's great. And, and editing stuff as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. I've just spotted the time. I want to I ask a few more questions, but um, I'm, I, I love having this conversation with you first because I think some of the technology stuff, yeah, it's just fascinating. And I love, you, I love your viewpoint on things. I also, I mean, I love what you're doing because for, for me personally, I've said this to you before, like when I come in and coach businesses, there's two real levers that um, I, I need to be able to pull. One is resourcing and the other one is tech. And the issue is um, if, you've, if you've got a business who's got a technology product that just doesn't, doesn't tick the workflow box, it doesn't tick the dashboard box, it doesn't tick the document, you know, it's, it's hard to use a CRM. It's, it, it, it's, you know, impossible for, to, to track anything in it. It makes everything hard. And particularly if you've got a software tool where, you know, it's just locked down at a higher level so nobody can use it. And I just, I love the way that you guys are developing this in such a way. And it's, it's you know, one of the things I think, that is always a problem with some CRMs in the industry or some financial planning tools is they're not built for the end user. They're sometimes built to service a licensee. But you're building this on a real case study to actually service the business itself. So it's awesome. If people want to know more about it and find out like the hundred things that it does that we haven't had an opportunity to, to, to talk about, like where would they go and how would they get the first look at it? Yeah, best place is a uh, website. So moasapp.com. Uh, yep. And that has plenty of images. It has the step-by-step -step process. It's got, you know, how we template our documents and work with you to template them. And then also how to produce the documents. So we sort of got into the advice process a little bit, but there's there's lots of information on the website about that. The okay. other one is docs.moasapp.com. Uh, we've recently released a just open documentation website. Uh, still a work in progress, but that has plenty of info on it as well. Um, and yeah, if you want to book any meetings uh, with me or the team, uh, we've got a Calendly link on the website. We can do 15 minutes, uh, hour demos, all that sort of stuff if you're interested. And um, yeah, that's the best way to get in contact. And the one thing, I know we've spoken about this, but I want to put it out there. The way you've priced it, are you, um, unlike a lot of firms, uh, like tools out there where you've got to basically, you've literally got to buy into it before you're in it. Like it's, you're basically sign the check and you're in. Yours is different. Your pricing, people can actually jump in, have a bit of a play with it and grow into it. How does it work? 
Yeah, so we, we actually pl- price per client and there's a lot of tools out there that we use in the industry, uh, client group, I should say, and yep. they price per client group as well, right? So the Yodely feeds is a great example. There's fixed cost and then per client group cost because you've got access to certain things. Yep. Um, and so what we wanted to do though is we didn't want to go, okay, well, it's X amount per this, per that, and then it ends up the same or more expensive than than other tools you're using. So what we did was we started with the average advisor statistics from advisor ratings, which was 120 clients a year. And what yep. we did was we priced it at $100 per client group per year, right? Which was, right. if you take that on face value, it's about $12,000 a year, right? Which is $1,000 a month you're spending on your X plans and likewise anyway. So what we did was we went, all right, well, first 10 clients are free. So that brings it down to 11. And then the majority of our advisors have less than 120 clients anyway, because they're nurturing right. those clients they have. So we've got, uh, one of our clients has 30 advisors, uh, sorry, 30 clients. Client. And he's got 10 for free and the 20 that he gets charged on a yearly basis for. So it's $2,000 a year for your full document production and modeling as opposed to $1,000 a month, right? Before you've actually generated any revenue. You've got yeah, to fork yeah, so that. You can kind of ease into it. And like I think last time I think of the conversation we had, and I, I'm putting on the spot here, but like what it could replace. But I mean, now you're at a position where you, if you've got to, my understanding is you've got a workflow management tool, like a projects or a Monday, sorry, team work projects or a Monday, you can get rid of that. If you if you've got a statement of advice uh, gen tool that generates and you, you can get rid of that, um, if you're using a separate dashboard to track everything, that you you can get rid of that as well. What else do you not need if you if you're using this? Yeah, I think you've I think you've hit the nail on the head. You know, the document production is handled, the yep. modeling's handled. Um, the only things most of our advisors are using are a, a well at the moment, right? Until we've finished our client portal, they're using a, a fact finding system and right. product recs for product comparisons. I love that you're doing portals. I just think portals are the future, and I think like I I always think about when we have these conversations about SOIs where they're going to be. I I think if we're talking about making the document shorter and more uh, succinct i honestly think we're talking about faster horses and at some point your client's going to log into your portal and and there it's, it's going to be there it's going to be live modeling and all the tools there and all the rest of it um yeah julia is just asking whether it does cash flow protections in different scenarios I th- yeah i think it does right do you mind if i share real quick i yeah, swear no, we can, can we can model this and produce a document in two minutes julia are you ready oh shall i shall i time it yeah, go go for it. Uh, okay. 11, 11. 58 is my watch. I'll go by. Okay, ready? Uh, wait, I'll just get the thing up. I'll give you time. Okay, under two minutes, you're going to model a scenario. This is, I love this. Under two okay. minutes, let's do it. Okay, so we've got our goals here. Oh, ready go. to go? Ready to go. Go. All right, so we, we've got our goals, retirement planning, offset, asset growth, and long-term progress. Those are historical. Our scenario data, so this is dummy data. We can duplicate from previous advice or from the current live data on the client page. We're going to call this our... Oh man, the test website's letting me down. It's that little bit slower. <laughs> We're going to call this our current scenario, right? And in the scenarios, it's just a streamlined version of the information we need for modeling. We're going to duplicate this. We've got our copy over here. Yep. Oh, the test website's really killing me today. Okay, we're going to call this our recommended, right? And yep. we're going to jump straight into our models. Now, these are ones I've used previously. So I'm just going to include our asset growth and our offset home loans, our loan repayment one. Okay, asset growth pulls through our historic information. You can add this as you want. We take a snapshot on the way through as well. Our offset one, we're going to switch into our current scenario. We're going to add the loan that we're modeling. So we've got our loan here until the expiry date in 2038. We're going to switch to our recommended. We're going to add a loan, same one. And then we're going to add our offset which will be the $44,000 one. Awesome. And we're going to add a contribution to this, right? So this will affect our cash flow. So we're going to add an ongoing contribution of $1,000 monthly. We're going to start this year, if I get the year right, and end in 2034. Let's do that. Cool. Awesome. So we can see that that's actually drawn it down even better because it's extra $12,000 a year. We're going to switch to our comparison. We can see that offsetting and contributing to that offset has made a massive impact, right? It's, that's oh, got to be a minute 30, Stu. How are we looking? You're at uh, 120 so far. 120? Great. Okay. I'm just going to add a new advice agreement. This is your advice costings to produce the advice. So I'm going to choose Carolyn as our primary advisor. It took us two hours to create this annual review, for example. We've got some default services in here as well, which you can customize yourself. We're going to add a new document. 
So this is from our templator that we've got in the side here. It works exactly the same as what we're about to look at, except it's for the templating, right? We've got locked content, locked pages that our licensee doesn't want us to delete. So we've got our compliance built in. Table of contents is looking good. Our goals have come through. I obviously need to move some text boxes here. And here's our cash flow, right? So, oh man, I'm missing it. There we go, this one. I'll switch to this one. We'll look at our recommended cash flow. Wonderful. And we've got our uh, income here. We've got estimated asset contributions. That's that $12,000 a year contribution to the offset mm -hmm. account. And now we're going to pull in our asset growth model. Oh no, my, oh, the test website's really doing me in. <laughs> go to the, I think you need to be just over, but it's pretty good, man. Loan repayment, let's go. Okay, offset home loans. There's our offset graph, right? And here's where we're going to put our comments and recommendations. Offset the home. Was that right. the home, man? Offset the home, man. Okay, so in two minutes, right, we've modeled an offset account, we've created our document, and we've provided some comments and recommendations. Julio, let me know what you think, mate. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, mate, oh, I, I, we should do this more often. We shouldn't, shouldn't leave it. And not just talk about the tool, but we should talk about other things. But I want to ask two questions, and then I'm kind of uh, going to open to any other questions. The one thing I wanted to first start by asking is the fact that it doesn't link. Like, obviously, businesses that are already, you know, they're just not, for them, uh, data feeds are not as important. And there's, and there's a whole bunch there. I know some of the best businesses that I've worked with, they don't use data feeds. It's just not, not, it's not necessarily. But like when you have businesses that are kind of just been brought up to the idea that, oh, you've got to have data feeds, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I think, I think some of those Is businesses- it a shift? Like it's a little bit of a shift. I think some of those businesses are entrenched in incumbent softwares. I won't name names and that's working for them. And that's cool, right? right? Uh, the majority of our advisors that we um, obviously started implementing with and now are working with already have solutions to that stuff where they're not right. content with the current offerings of an incumbent, for example, right? So I think there's this sort of myth though and I, I might, Stu, I might lose a lot of your audience here, but there's this myth where if the number is there, just run with it and do it. And advisors have had it too good for too long, in my opinion, where that number has been there and they've just sort of gone, all right, yeah, we're just going to run with it. But the reality the number is- being the, the number in the system. Number in the system, yeah, right? Yeah, cool. So uh, the reality is a lot of advisors will go, okay, number's there. I'm going to send a power planning briefing off. It's going to come back in three weeks. It, there's going to be stuff we're going to have to change and send it off for another two weeks, right? What we wanted to get away from was that reliance on just the number being there. So if you've got your third party tool, come in and update it. You know, we've got our teams and our solo advisors that are updating these values throughout the year anyway. Um, a classic was, you know, we had uh, we had a super platform that wasn't connected to any data feeds anyway. So we had to manually get those statements. And then of course, with your big players, the data feeds were down for a month. So we had to go and get them manually right. anyway. So yeah. we went, look, we can't rely on doing the data feed piece this early on. It's probably too much at the time. It was too much for our team to tackle. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's, it's definitely a shift. I think going from, you know, this, the dependence on the data feeds to actually going, well, look, I'm looking this stuff up anyway. We're missing insurance feeds too. So we've got to look that up manually. It's so, tricky. So that question, I think like obviously importing and exporting, like I always say to people, if you, if you, if you can't get your, if it's not clear how you can get your, your data out of a platform, you need to really be careful about what you're putting into it. And obviously, you know, if you, and Julio has made the point, if you're transitioning across from another platform or, you, you know, you do have a fact finding software that'll spit out a CSV file. Can you map that and upload it pretty easily? Or is that, is that something that you need to get, engage your team to do? Yeah, hundred percent. So, um, yeah, you, you'd, we'd, we'd engage with it, um, but there's no cost. We don't believe in any of that. Right. Since we've had so many people download data from other systems and get charged for it, which is nuts yeah, when you I, look at like data access laws and stuff. Right. Um, it's, so yeah, it's, look, it's common though, right? It's, it's, it's a common, it's not uncommon practice for, for, for software providers to hold the data ransom. It's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's super common and it's nuts, right? So we don't charge for imports, uploads, exports, any of that stuff. Um, we have some standard stuff that's mapped. Like we have uh, like your generic X plan um, download that, that's just like client names and that sort of stuff. We have that right. pre-mapped. So depending on what you download, we can just put it straight in from our end and it goes straight up. Um, other stuff like maybe more specific asset liability info, we just take a little bit of time to tweak that so it fits okay. into our format. But like, for example, if I had a fact finding tool, and I could get my team to put it into a CSV file and it 
uh, would you would you give me okay format the CSV file so it's got these headings and then it could just upload it straight in? Is that the way it would work? Yeah, absolutely. So with some stuff, we'd do that. And then with things that are more complex, where you're like, hey, I, I don't know what's going on here. We're happy right. to look at that and, and figure out where it fits. So, In terms of, and this is kind of the big question, in terms of you've worked with businesses and predominantly, I'm assuming they're transitioning across from another platform. How yeah. long does it take? How long does it take to get them up and running? And I guess the, here's the million dollar question. What, what benefits do you generally see that they, they, they're getting from being on a tool like yours? Great question. So we had a recent sign up, signed up on the Monday. We have a bunch of default templates available, uh, produced advice during the week. And we obviously, a lot of hand holding in that process and uh, knowledge transfer and understanding. Uh, produced the SOA on the Friday, delivered it the following week. Um, so, you know, that was a week to get a client through a new SOA. Um, so that was amazing for us. Uh, just as an experience, we went, did that, did that actually happen that quickly, right? Um, so, and then for bigger businesses, you know, we, depending on your import process and how that works, depending on how many staff are going to use it from day one is a whole other thing. But generally with, with advisors, we're you know, individual advisors. So let's say if we pilot with a small team and we bring in 10, 20, 30 clients, generally it's about a week, um, before you're feeling really confident and, and producing documents. Um, and then in terms of what you get out of it, I mean, Ease of use is massive. Um, we, our original business we uh, implemented with WealthMed, they had an internal study of seven hours and 20 minutes to produce an annual review. We got that down to two hours and 10 minutes on average, and that was 1,200 documents in two years. So we were, were pretty comfortable with that number, right? Uh, and then client yeah. experience. I mean, the difference we've had in client experience is incredible. So. We've yeah. had retirees that have come in that have gone, you know what, can the font be bigger? Can I read this easier? Yes, you can obviously change all of that. Uh, but also just the general understanding, you know, if this is going to sound silly, this is a terrible analogy, right? But in some models, if line goes up, it's good. If line goes down, it's bad, right? Being able to convey that really, really simply when you're talking yeah. about retirement, capital maintenance is super important. So yeah. client experience has been brilliant. The feedback we've had from our advisors for using it, and obviously we're really reactive as well. As soon as there's something we the advisors feel like we should change, we work on. Uh, and then client experience with documents has been phenomenal. Like we are so happy with the experience that our, our end users, which is the, your clients, are receiving. So we're, we're super stoked with that. Mate, congratulations. I mean, I know you guys have been working your asses off really hard. And I know you're at that stage where you've got you've got a great tool. You, you've got a small team, you put your hearts into it. And I think you, and we talked about you just, you just need to reach that tipping point when you can start to reinvest and expand the team. And it sounds like it's headed that direction really, really quickly. So, mate, I, I, it's so good to watch and see. Cheers, Stu. It certainly feels that way. So we sort of went to market in October last year and obviously Christmas is really quiet. Uh, we've had, I think, three or four signups since going back to business in January. So, uh, yeah, we're hitting the ground running pretty hard and there's so much more left to come. You know, we've, we've got, like I said before, we've got the meat and veg now, all the niceties and stuff that we get to add on with your client portals yeah. and data feeds is just going to take it to a new level. Portal's going to be incredible. We should talk about that because I love portals. Well, you know, I mean, like I've, I've had more portals than I have had dinners in the last 10 years. So <laughs> that's not sure. I've had definitely a lot of dinners. Mate, um, any final thoughts? And by the way, if there's any questions you want to pop up, I know Julio, you just asked a question. Martin, really appreciate your thoughts. Um, any final thoughts you want to make? Yeah, I think, um, look, general advice to advisors in the industry is, you know, keep your ear to the ground. Um, there are solutions out there now like Product Rex, man. I mean, I can't, I can't speak highly enough of it. It's, it's a free-to-use tool for product comparisons, right? So when things like that come up, you've got to be willing to dip the toe in the water and see what's happening there. Um, and we're certainly getting a lot of that with advisors now that are that are going solo or you know changing licensee structure. Um, and that's not to say that we're just a, a self-licensed bit that like practice working with it or anything. Yep. Um, but yeah, definitely keeping your ear to the ground, fingers on the pulse, and and play with everything. Um, the AI tools that are out there now for general general writing and general help are incredible. Um, so yeah, lots of great tech coming, but definitely try and make the most of it. I think. I read I read a report. As I, so I was preparing for a presentation I got to give where um, it indicated that, uh, where am I going with this? Yeah, the second largest market share currently is by, by, a, by a tool that's only come around in the last four or five years and is, it was built, created by practice and it's getting real traction. And I think we're now starting to see these, these, these tools like yours that have actually been forged not in 
with all due respect, corporate headquarters by software developers who've never actually seen a financial planning business. They've actually been forged from being, you know, actually road tested. So that's what's exciting about it. You, you've got this whole generation of tools coming out that actually do what's needed. And I think you're, you're a massive part of that. So congratulations. Cheers, Stu. Yeah, I, I actually think that's where the, that disconnect's sort of been, right? Is it's either software built by advisors through third-party tech companies or vice yep. versa, like tech companies building it without advice input. Um, so to have that, I think that's what's really benefited us was to yeah. have that collaboration between the two. Absolutely agree. Uh, Julio, he's full of crap. You guys should definitely catch up and have a chat because I think you'll, you, you'll like what he's got. I should, to be honest, anybody watching this, you should reach out and, and, and just, just jump in there and have, uh, get, jump, get the free sort of account because, I um, mean, it's, it's, yeah, when you get in there, you realize how easy it is. Julio wants to know, are you going to integrate with Product Rex? Julia, fantastic question. So it's certainly on our radar. Uh, we haven't put the feelers out just yet, but it's definitely like if we if we can get to a point where you can do your product Rex modeling and comparisons and we can pull that into the document, that's definitely where we want to be. But if we can get to that point, yeah, th there's no question. Uh, that's certainly where we want to go. Free as well. So it's the price is right. Yeah, totally. Totally. <laughs> Mate, always a pleasure. Um, enjoy it. What do you got planned for the weekend? Anything good? Um... I'm actually, I'm coaching football, soccer this year. So I've got a few games on this weekend. And then Sunday, I think we're going to go up to Noosa, maybe go for a swim if the weather's right. So Nice, nice. Are you, are you playing and coaching or? No, I, I wish. I think my, my playing days are a bit behind me. Um, so just trying to, just trying injury, to learn. It, can't, it's, it's, it, must be, it must be injury because it's not, it's not age, put it that way. Oh, no, definitely, definitely not injury. It's just uh, I think the lungs don't do what they should do. Uh, there's some players out there that can just run and run and run, and I don't think I'm one of them, sadly. Yeah, it's it's kind of that game. I remember used to, when we used to training, and um, uh, you just like the first forty minutes was just running, and it's yeah, it's easier to play when you're when you're fit, I guess. Totally, it totally is. Yeah, mate. Thanks again for your time. Have a great weekend, and everybody, thank you very much for for joining me, and uh, I'll see you in the next one. Wonderful. Thank you, Stu. See ya. Bye.